Kia ora Koto and welcome to the Better Public Media uh, meeting, um, a meeting on media issues. Um, it's quite an a opportune time. Uh, it seems to always be an opportune time for a, a, a crisis meeting about media, to be honest, um, but possibly more so than usual at the moment. Um, and so, yeah, and uh, we've got a, a cracker lineup of speakers for you. Um, we've got Irene Gardner, who um, we've got, uh, sorry, Irene Gardner, Peter Thompson, Brent McAnulty, and Paul Thompson. Um, but before I uh, introduce them, um, I'll just go through some of the housekeeping rules. Unfortunately, I don't have to explain where the bathrooms are, but I do need to explain to you um, that we are not, uh, we're, we're going to be uh, taking questions after we've had introductory uh, uh, s s talks from our guests, uh, but they'll be done via chat. Your questions, we really welcome your questions, but please put them in the chat function and then David will be reading them out. Uh, and that's a way to make sure we only get questions and not long um, comments. Um, also, when you do put in your, uh, put into your questions, you're mo most welcome to put in lots of questions if you want, but if they're for one of the, for one of the particular speakers, um, please let us know. Um, so that, um, so for example, if it's for uh, Brent relating to TVNZ or Paul relating to RNZ, um, then please, please let us know who the speaker, uh, who the question is for, and we can direct it directly to them. Um, I don't think you're actually able to turn on your mic, but please don't. But if uh, if you've asked a question and you're not happy with the answer, let us know and we'll come back to you and, um, and provide you with an opportunity for a follow-up question. Um, yeah, I think that's basically it, really. Uh, the, um, the first speaker we'll have is uh, Irene Gardner. So I first actually met Irene in the 90s, um, early 90s, in fact, when I was a video editor and she was a director for, um, it was a TV show called The Edge, an arts program, back when arts programs existed. And uh, it was, uh, I discovered that she's an amazingly wonderful person, but also a really great boss. She's very clear and very good at making decisions, which is actually what you really want in a director. Um, she had previously worked at uh, on music shows uh, like Radio with Pictures and RTR and directed some children's shows, but she went on to produce news programs, factual programs at TVNZ, uh, and then became a commissioner at TV1. I didn't realise this, but she became a commissioner at TV1, was even the head of commissioning uh, there for several years, and then um, continued producing and consulting uh, was content director at New Zealand on screen and um, more recently you've moved into a governance role Irene and um, you're on a few uh, very important boards but also uh, you were on the uh, you were appointed to the ministerial advisory group um, which was set up by Claire Curran the forerunner to the strong public media um, group uh, and a couple of years ago you uh, she became the president of Sparta which is the Screen Production and Development Association. And it's in that context that she joined us today as the president of Sparta. So um, thanks, Irene, if you could um, just, yeah, tell us why you're here and, and what your views are on the Oh moment. my goodness, how long have I got, Miles? <laughs> I could go for days on this topic. Um, shall I aim for about five minutes? Yeah, yeah, five to ten minutes would be great. Um, thank you for that lovely intro. I do remember being in, in an editing booth with you all those many years ago. Um, and yeah, I've done a lot of different things since then. But I'm here wearing my Sparta president hat today. Uh, Sparta obviously represents the interests of New Zealand's screen producers, both film and television. Uh, it is a very, very, very tough time for local production at the moment. It's never easy in New Zealand because obviously we're a small population country and therefore a small potential viewing audience. But over the last few years, as the international streaming companies and other big tech companies have been able to operate in New Zealand without any real regulation um, and not paying tax, and using our broadband structure, they have taken an enormous amount of eyeballs and therefore advertising revenue. Uh, it's been getting worse and worse. We've been lobbying for some time 
to have them levied in some way so that we could get some money back into the industry that way. Uh, I know, Peter Thompson, you've been doing the same, I think even longer than Sparta has. Uh, I guess what I had hoped in my ever optimistic way was that we would get that new revenue, get that problem solved, and then we would move into that area of having that money before advertising revenue, you know, dried up really drastically. But unfortunately, a combination of the years of the streamers operating here, plus generally the economy not being great, both international and globally, we've had a bit of a fall off the cliff. And as you will all know, both TVNZ and Three, who are traditionally our biggest um, commissioners of local content, are making massive cutbacks to local production. Uh, Sparta's done a bit of a calculation and across the two of them, it's about $50 million coming out of our industry, which is massive. Uh, it's the shows that have historically been fully funded by the networks from advertising revenue that are most valuable, most vulnerable. Um, unfortunately, that includes Shortland Street, which has been fully funded by TVNZ in recent years. Uh, some of the more public media shows, uh, you know, are funded obviously by our funding agencies, NZ On Air, um, the Film Commission, and Tamangai Pal. Uh, even there's a, there's a vulnerability across the board, though, because as well as taking out the ability to fully fund shows, uh, there's also the, the money that will go into the other shows that have either funding agency money or international money or corporate sponsor money. That money will still be spread a little more thinly. Uh, if I could say one bright spot, <laughs> uh, it is that our producers have become a lot more entrepreneurial in recent years, a lot more innovative. Um, you will have noticed there's lots of New Zealand shows screening around the world now, either co-productions or shows that we've sold. That's been an area that's been gain gaining a great deal of momentum and has been really great for us both culturally and economically. It's been helped by, uh, I think, now 15 years of the screen production rebate plus the COVID-specific uh, premium fund. So that is a bright spark, and that is, you know, obviously a source of money for our industry. But if local production, the money that we're getting from our funding agencies plus advertising revenue gets too small and too tight, it it potentially threatens that. So there's an economic loss there in terms of potential export dollar, et cetera. And obviously there is a massive cultural and societal loss if the New Zealand voice is reduced too much. Uh, and so that is our big fear at the moment. What we're working on with government is getting the streamers levy to happen, whether it is a separate thing from the digital media bill, which is for journalism, or whether they, in fact, combine the two things into some sort of a levy across. That's something we can all talk about today. Um, so that's obviously been our big lobbying point. We've also been lobbying that the three funding agencies be exempted from the 7.5 across the board government cuts, which I think is actually very fair because that's, I mean, yeah, sure, back room, but that's actually our contestable funding. That's our public media spend. It's a slightly different thing. Uh, and our public media spend is quite small by international standards. So at the very least, if we can not have the 7.5 come out, in an ideal world, if we could have about 20 million go in across our three funders, that isn't the 50 million, but it would keep us going till we can potentially get the money out of the streamers or get a bit more ad rev out of um, TVNZ and three once they go more fully digital and get through the expensive times of their digital transition. So yeah, some money into the funding coffers would really, really help. I appreciate that might be politically tricky, but again, I think it's money that would be a good investment. It would, it would have a return on investment and it would help preserve uh, the local voice. I'm obviously talking about local production here, but it crosses very much into local journalism as well. They're, they're very connected. And I'm sure Paul will talk about that uh, when, when he um, does his piece. Um, so yeah, we're asking for that. And then that's the two big things, um, funding agencies and levying the streamers, but the smaller things, and actually not so small, um, if Cordia fees, Cordia transmission fees uh, for both 3 and TVNZ could be waived by the government, 
I didn't actually know the sum, but I have read a couple of people saying lately it's about $40,000. Well, gosh, if that could be earmarked for local production, that could be handy. So that's an option. Um, and yeah, let TVNZ stop, uh, continue not paying a dividend while it goes through its digital transition. And then lastly, we could look at the screen production rebate and whether there's anything that could be done uh, just to make that a little more user friendly for domestic. One thing in particular, if we could alter the uh, the thresholds, the minimums on it, budget minimums, we could potentially get Shortland Street to be eligible, which would take the full burden of paying for it off TVNZ. That's very similar to a little tweak that's been done in Australia recently to save home and away, because I think there is a feeling that both in terms of um, you know, supporting a screen industry, but also just culturally, a country needs a soap. What would New Zealand be if we didn't have Shortland Street? Uh, there's lots of that that I could expand on, but that's a reasonably reasonably good summation of the problem and where we're at and what we need. So I will stop. Thank you, Irene. <laughs> the country needs a soap. We We need a lot of things, but you're right. We need a soap as well. It's good to have one. Thank you. That was really great. Okay, I'll move on to Peter Thompson, uh, who is uh, Dr. Peter Thompson. Sorry, Peter. I <laughs> know you don't really care about that. Um, so he is famous for having annoyed every minister of broadcasting or media since 1999. Well done, Peter. Um, he started his academic career with a BA in the University of Liverpool, uh, and then got a master's from the University of Leicester. I assume these are all in uh, media and communications related fields. Uh, and then a PhD from RMIT University in Melbourne. He also taught uh, and tutored in the subject in uh, Thailand and Singapore before arriving in New Zealand in 1997, where he was a lecturer at Unitech before moving to uh, to Heading a Waka uh, 14, 12, 13 or 14 years ago, I think it was. Um, and he is now Associate Professor there, undertaking commissioned research for MCH and other government departments and NGOs. And I think it's fair to say that Peter is New Zealand's preeminent expert in public media. Um, so over to you, Peter. Oh, well, uh, Peter Thompson, this is your life. Thank you very <laughs> much, Miles. Um, and Kiara Koto, thank you very, very much to everyone for coming along. Uh, so gratifying to know that other people really care about these debates. Um, I, I was going to say a few of the same things that, that Irene already covered, so I'm, I'm going to be a little bit, little bit circumspect on those. But I think what we've seen over the last 12 months is really the culmination of what was set in motion over three decades ago of deregulated competition in the media sector, you know, uh, intense commercialization and fundamentally under under investment in our public media sector, um, certainly compared with other similar countries. I mean, we've seen digital convergence and the capture of the lion's share of digital advertising by the big platforms. Um, I think the figures I had suggest that Google alone now accounts for something like two thirds of the 1.8 billion digital advertising market. That's about half the overall digital spend. But one company, you know, pulling in basically two thirds of that chunk. I mean, it's it's crazy. What we're also seeing, though, is the fragmentation of audiences across new digital services and platforms, streaming services in particular. And so the traditional business models of the commercial sector have dwindled. I mean, I've got a couple of figures, did a bit of homework, if you look at the advertising share, you know, the share of the overall advertising spend if back in 2000, uh, newspapers had something like 35%, um, and that's now down to about 17. So that's halved. Um, newspapers got it even worse. They used to have about 40% of the advertising market. That's now down to less than 10 you know, you know, and if you put those two you know, figures alongside what's happening with Google and Meta and the other platforms, you, you see the pattern. And when we see events like Warner Brothers Discovery closing its entire new news hub operation, and, T and I'll ask Brent about this later, but TVNZ axing longstanding programs like Fair Go and Sunday, even when they're actually making money. What we see is a commercial media sector that's been so tightly squeezed, they simply cannot absorb 
any kind of opportunity cost where they might maintain public interest content. So, I mean, some people said that what we'd seen this year was the canary in the coal mine. <laughs> I don't think that's true. I think that canary fell off its perch a long time ago, at least a decade ago. I mean, that's bereft of life, you know, gone to meet its maker and pushing up the daisies. What we're seeing now is a huge explosion. And so there's a massive need for new revenues in this sector. And for over a decade, I've been talking about the possibility of introducing a levy. So what I would like to talk to you about next is this idea of what a levy might look like. The idea of a levy is to actually make the market pay for its own market failures. Um, I mean, you could slightly rudely call it the polluter pays principle that if the commercial media make loads of money out of their own operations and that puts pressure on the supply of public media, then maybe some of those commercial revenues could go back into providing public media. Now, there's a number of ways we could do this. Um, I mean, the first question is scope. What services might be subject to levy, uh, which are exempt? So I, I would start with digital advertising, digital services. You could put it on turnover or, or online advertising spend. You could put it on subscription video on demands. You know, uh, so Netflix, Sky, maybe. Uh, you could put it on mobile and broadband services. Oh, we already do. It's called the telecommunications development levy. Uh, or you could even retail, and this is a new one, sales of audiovisual hardware. I mean, Harvey Norman and Noel Leeming will have my face on a dartboard, but they've made billions out of the fact that they sell hardware, software, all the technologies that support the digital media ecology, you know, go through those chains. And you could give exclusions to companies that have low turnovers or those that invest in local content. But, but the obvious ones, of course, are the big platforms here. Well, how much should we make them pay? What was that, 100%? Well, I'd agree, but they won't buy that. Well, let's have a look at a couple of examples. I mean, you could either uh, set them incrementally so that, that the biggest media companies paid a higher rate, or you could set it out saying, well, we need $100 million in the sector or $50 million in the sector, and, and that's how much we need to collect across all the services. That's actually how the telecom development levy works. If we look at Austria, They've got a 5% levy on digital advertising, 5%. If we did that here, you'd be getting 85 to $90 million a year. Denmark has a 6% levy on subscription video on demand services like Netflix. Now, that would get about $24 million here in New Zealand. If you add Sky to that, probably go up to somewhere in the region of well, you know, 35, 40. Um, if you put a 3% levy on telecommunications, any guesses? $150 million, you know, so we're, we're talking jackpot there. 2% levy on audiovisual retail goods, about the same, $140, $150 million. Put those two together, we're talking hundreds of millions of dollars for very, very small amounts. You know, if you bought a new television and you paid an extra 10 bucks when you bought it, would you riot in the streets? I don't think so. If your Netflix account cost $16, not $15, you know, would there be huge protests? I don't think so. And if you just levied the whole caboodle, you'd still be getting even a 1% across all of those. You'd still get about $150, $160 million. This is game changing. Yeah. And, and I've been saying this for a decade and nobody's listened. So I don't know if the government will listen now, but I think it would be interesting. Well, what do you do with all that money? <laughs> well. There's, there's a number of arguments you could have here about where it goes. But, for example, you know, if you wanted to reinvent the public interest journalism fund, much maligned, um, not helped, I have to say, by some politicians who made comments about it being bribery, which clearly wasn't the case. Um, but but if you say, say you wanted to do that, that would be about $50, $60 million a year. So just a 3% levy on digital advertising would do that. Um, New Zealand Air funding... Currently, about $137 million going into program production. 2% uh, levy on, on audiovisual retail, you've covered it. You want public media? The, the abandoned Aotearoa New Zealand public media bill, and we agreed that there were some problems with it. We thought they were fixable, but the government abandoned the whole thing. 
But if that was going to cost about $109 million a year, well, there's multiple permutations of a levy. You could cover all of that. You know, you could have public media, you could have local content, you could save the news sector. You know, you could do the whole thing. So levies are transparent. They're proportional to the amount of commercial revenue that these big companies generate out of the media market. If they do get passed on to the consumer, it's at a very low level where most people won't really notice. And it's still proportional to the amount of media they consume. So the people who pay the most are the ones that pay for the most media. Now, you can quibble over where it goes and what the priority is, and that's another conversation. But in principle, a levy would fix a whole load of problems. And I think that time has come, and I think the time is now. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Kakite. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. I think everyone's uh, virtually clapping you, uh, and also Irene previously as well. Um, our next speaker uh, to, to give a little intro is Brent McAnulty. Um, and I'll just introduce uh, or just ex explain who he is. He's the Chief Operating Officer at TVNZ. But he, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Brent, but you started at life as a lawyer, specialising in commercial law, um, worked for a few years in London, then came back to be in-house counsel at Telecom and then TVNZ. But I discovered uh, that previously you were a sports producer for Radio Pacific uh, and also on the board of Sport Waitakere. Um, at TVNZ, Brent has moved into governance now and is a direct, was a director uh, for Igloo and Freeview and then it became the company secretary, corporate affairs director for 10 years, serving under Kevin Kenrick and Simon Power. Um, but then uh, for six months uh, after, after Power, uh, Simon Power left, uh, after you know, a short tenure of six months, uh, Brent was the CEO, uh, acting CEO, of TVNZ at a very tumultuous time for uh, TVNZ when it was going through supposedly preparing for a merger with RNZ, which never then didn't happen. I know a lot of a lot of preparation did happen in the background, and that must have been a very um, difficult and busy time to be an acting CEO. Um, with the appointment of Jody Donnell, um, uh, Brent, it must be on feeling like he's on holiday just uh, as the Chief Operating Officer. But I really want to thank you, Brent, for coming along to speak to us today, and over to you. Oh, kia ora, Miles. Tēnā tātou katoa, everyone. Um, look, um, thank you very much uh, to you, Miles, for that introduction. Thank you to the for the Trust for bringing um, this group together today. This is what we call off-peak for 4 p.m. on a Sunday, but you've pulled in a, in a huge audience. I think we're up to about five pages. Uh, and I've scrolled through, so a lot of... Uh, a lot of friends here, and this would uh, have to be probably the most clued up media audience that I've ever had the pleasure of speaking to. So um, I won't start at the beginning. Um, Irene and Peter have um, spoken very well um, about about some of the, the possibilities um, to, to help solve the, the dilemma we're all in. I, Irene in particular on behalf of um, of the screen industry. Um, I thought I, I would I'll just talk a wee bit um, uh, about TVNZ and just where where we're at at the moment, because obviously there's been a lot. Um, we, we've been in the media ourselves, um, a, a lot being reported on as as much as uh, reporting others recently. So um, we talk a lot about the Broadcasting Act and the need for that to be uh, to, to be to be looked at and reviewed, and and I'll come to that in a minute. But another act we don't talk about quite a bit is the Television New Zealand Act, which sets out our reason for being, and uh, it is. Um, if you have a look at it, it's very, very strong um, uh, imperative there that we are a commercial organisation. And all the time I've been at TVNZ, I think the word that sums up out my time here has been about balance. While we have been uh, a commercial entity for almost all of that time uh, or, or, or focused on commercial, um, we've also uh, recognised that the balance that we do need to create content that resonates with New Zealanders and make content where New Zealanders can see themselves reflected on screen. And that's really important. But we know that, or um, well, many of you will know, that that content costs a lot of money. And, and so that's why I talk about balance, because if we were purely commercial, we would do things quite differently, um, but we'd lose our point of difference, which is, which is uh, to have New Zealand content um, 
you know, uh, front and centre um, on our screens. Um, we traditionally operate with a pretty small margin, um, uh, being being self sufficient, and and uh, very important that we uh, live uh, within our means. Um, and and the headwinds that we've we've faced in the last sort of eighteen months in particular, and also I think the diversion, the the sort of the division of our um, of our attention around the uh, the, um, the SPM work um, that that Miles referred to as well uh, ha has meant that we're we're in a position now where we have had to make some really um, you know really difficult calls on on cutting back our budget. We still in this this year will spend about one hundred and fifty million dollars on content and um, just under a third of that uh, in the news space. Um, but but uh, what we have managed to do with the um, you know with the good grace of, of the previous government and the one before that as well is uh, we've managed to uh, accumulate um, and run a, a, a pretty strong balance sheet which sees us in a position to fund our transformation going forward. Uh, and and we'll start. You'll start seeing that as viewers um, how that plays out uh, pretty soon in the, in, the, in the sort of products that we offer. But at the moment, we're going through a, a large uh, rebuild of our IP platform and our enterprise um, software system as well. When I look at the the media sector uh, as a whole, um, look, I, I, I like I love the ideas that Peter has has come up with, and he's um, obviously sharpened his pencil and and looked at different ways that the media can be supported. Um, I actually think that the funding structure that we have in New Zealand, the bones are pretty good. Um, I think what, what New Zealand On Air and Tamangai Paho have done in particular and the way that they conduct themselves is um, is something that um, I, I know other jurisdictions have looked at and looked on favourably. Um, the problem at the moment is that there is less money and uh, and I know from the the projects or the, the the programs that we put up for funding uh, each funding round, uh, the calibre of uh, of program that we're putting up that's getting knocked back is rising each time, which is a real shame. And there's some there's some things that I know would really resonate with New Zealand audiences that 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 uh, aren't receiving the funding. But we're not in a unique position. Um, uh, if you haven't seen it already, I'll commend to you, Mr. Bates, uh, and the post office, John TVNZ Plus. Uh, ITV uh, just in the last couple of days have said that um, even with overseas sales and even with it being one of the most viewed programs in the UK uh, this year, uh, it's run about a million pound loss for that. For that. And, um, and and then across in Australia at the moment, um, you, we're seeing a real dearth of, of local Australian uh, drama hitting screens. And in fact, the 65% um, of all Australian and drama on screens in the past 12 months uh, in Australia uh, has been home and away and neighbours. So that's two thirds of the market from, from, from two shows. So I think, you know, I come to work each day and, and my job is to, is to you know, help this place thrive. But I think for all of us who are working in media, we need to think what's actually best for New Zealand media, what's best for New Zealand. And I think funding our culture is important. You know, we've... we've um, We've we've all had to put our hand in our pocket to you know to, to rescue a national airline uh, a couple of times in our history. I see this as just as important. It's our identity and and uh, and, and and something we should um, we we that's why these meetings are really important and 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 the sort of things that Peter is suggesting um, need to be looked at and, um, and and we need to make some change because uh, we'll wake up one day and we'll be gone if we're if we're not careful. Great. Thank you, Brent. Thank you very much. Uh, interesting, interesting perspective and good words there. Um, so now uh, next, our last speaker uh, is Paul Thompson, who's the Chief Executive of Radio New Zealand. Um, Paul is a journalist, I think it's fair to say, first and foremost, um, but I, <laughs> I did sit to go do a Google on Paul, and you are also a footballer. Um, so you played for the Waikato United team in the early 90s. Uh, wrote a piece for the club called Players Perspective. I don't know if that was the beginning of your journalism writing career, or at some point, <laughs> just a just a kind of a side a side hustle. Um, you uh, Paul was the editor at the Press from uh, in Christchurch from two thousand and one to two thousand and seven, and then he became the editor of Fairfax Media 
in general from 2008 to 2013. Um, at which point he was poached by Radio New Zealand to become their chief executive from 2013. He's also the editor-in-chief there and he's been there. And I think you've had the longest tenure of anyone. I heard someone say this at RNZ. Uh, so well done to you. Um, you all, he, Paul is also the president of the Public Media Alliance, which is little known in New Zealand, but it's actually the International Association of Public Media Broadcasters and Platforms. So it's a really large and important organisation. And it's great that a New Zealander is the president of that. Um, so, yeah, uh, over to you, Paul. Thanks very much for joining us. And over to you. Yeah, thanks, Miles. Kia ora, everyone. Uh, thanks for the reference to my uh, footballing days, Miles, uh, long past. Um, but look, if I can just start by um, just acknowledging the work of Better Public Media, it's a really important job that you're doing. And thank you for arranging um, this event. Um, at the risk of stating the obvious, uh, we do have a serious problem and the other uh, panellists have already talked to that, but I just, just want to talk briefly to that. Um, and the problem is around sustainability of, uh, of the local um, content and news sector um, probably something maybe we've taken for granted and just thought it would always be there. I think we're very much now in a time when we have to be very intentional about how we support it and nurture it. Um, commercial models have weakened. They're never going to be fixed. They've changed forever. Um, that means there are fewer journalists, definitely fewer stories, um, fewer journalists in the regions, as well as fewer journalists, journalists overall, um, less content of all types, um, fewer people coming into our industry, which is possibly not something we've thought a lot about, but I think it is a, a looming issue. Um, at the same time, the global platforms are ascendant um, and largely unregulated in New Zealand. Uh, our, you know, New Zealand is not alone in uh, dealing with some of the challenges I've just talked about, but I think we are in some ways more vulnerable than most because we're English speaking and our market is very unregulated. Um, to get a little bit more depressing before I get to the positive stuff, there's also a deep-seated uh, challenge in New Zealand around trust, including trust in the media, and that's affecting all New Zealand outlets and audiences and our communities. I mean, these problems are complex and they are formidable, but not dealing with them isn't an option, because um, if you look at it from every angle, um, there's no way that we can be a sovereign, independent um, nation. Um, thriving as a democracy and as, and as a connected and informed community without a robust uh, fourth estate and a really um, diverse and creative uh, screen sector and content sector. So not fixing this and not addressing it is not an option. So I think as we look at what we need to do, um, top of mind should be um, supporting plurality in the market and choice. So one of the real dangers that we've got is that there'll be consolidation, maybe some failures and some consolidation of ownership, maybe increased foreign ownership. And we have to keep coming back to that key point. The main thing we need to deliver for New Zealand is, is a plurality of media reflecting um, you know, the nation as a whole, our communities, our regions. Um, it needs to have public media, commercial media, um, ethnic media. There needs to be traditional players and innovative players. So that's probably an idea I'll keep coming back to. The idea of plurality needs to be top of mind. Um, so change is required. And I did just want to point out how hard every media outlet in New Zealand is uh, trying to meet those challenges and adapting. There's a lot of change going on. And some of those are in the, in, in the headlines. And it's been some really grim uh, news for our industry of late. But it is worth noting that every business, every media business in New Zealand is really trying to grapple with its own issues individually and in some ways collectively. Um, and so, you know, the sector itself has to take the lead role in addressing these problems. Um, we can't just sit there and expect um, people to fix this for us. And no one's going to ride it on a white horse. Uh, but we also have to acknowledge that other stakeholders are really important to kind of provide the range of uh, measures that we're going to have to have to fix these challenges. Um, so those include the Crown, who obviously have a big role to play, but also includes academia and civil society, industry organisations and the platforms themselves, and indeed at some point maybe audiences and the public. We all have a stake in this. We can't 
function as a society unless we address these issues. Um, in terms of um, some of the topics already talked about today, I think if you look across the media sector um, globally and in New Zealand, the main issue is one of revenue. And even for a public broadcaster where we're publicly funded, funding has always been our challenge. And until we um, received a, um, a baseline increase in this financial year, RNZ was always struggling with, um, with funding. And that's quite common across public media, but funding challenges are also exist and growing for all media. So I do think that um, uh, the country, our New Zealand should look very seriously at creating a levy of some kind that's flexible, inflation indexed, um, and independent of government, uh, but obviously supported through regulation to allow us to, to create more revenue for our sector. And, before we get too bogged down in figuring out how we'd actually manage that levy, who would get it, who'd we, who we administered, I think we should just be really united on the thought that a new revenue source is going to be required. In terms of RNZ, just if I can talk briefly at RNZ, we've, we're doubling down on our public media charter. We're really focused on delivering on our, um, on our mandate, our statutory mandate, and that's all about um, our vision of providing outstanding public media that matters um, and really understanding our unique role. So we see ourselves as uh, the cornerstone of the public media ecosystem in New Zealand. That's the public media ecosystem. Um, we um, are using our new funding to um, modernise the organisation and invest in new technology. This is just to make sure that our the people who work at RNZ are using modern tools. We're also investing in our standards and quality after the uh, issue we had last year, the very difficult issue we had last year uh, with the inappropriate editing of stories. Uh, we have implemented the 22, fully implemented the 22 recommendations of the independent review panel. We're also investing in trust research. We've appointed Jane Patterson um, our former political editor as our uh, to lead our editorial content and training. So we're really trying to make sure that we can, um, as I said before, double down on our public media ma mandate and really understand that vital, unique role that we play. We're also um, conducting research into what is driving the loss of trust in New Zealand media. And that's in the, in the field at the moment. And we'll be um, thinking, uh, bring that research uh, to the public soon. And we're going to be sharing it with the industry. Um, the other thing that we're very focused on is collaborating. I talked about that importance of us being a cornerstone of the public media sector. We have around 60 content sharing arrangements under our radical sharing strategy. And we really want to um, power up our collaborative endeavours uh, including looking at things like establishing a newswire for New Zealand in the next 12 months. So watch that space. Um, we, um, we wonder whether some of the challenges that are facing the commercial media sector means that RNZ should be working more closely with public media entities to um, do some new things for New Zealanders. Um, so we see our relationships with the likes of Community Access Radio, Fakata Māori, Iwi Radio and Public Media, our Pacific Media Network is really vital. How can we have great partnerships with, with all of those organisations? Um, just kind of, if I can just, just uh, summarise, I think one of the, um, and I'll just go back to the issues we're facing as a whole. Um, one thing I noted from the debate about the um, proposed creation of a new public media entity integrating RNZ and TVNZ. And we know, as we know, that in the end was cancelled. What I noted from that was maybe people got too focused on building something that was perfect and um, that there is a temptation when reform is being um, suggested and developed and new ideas being put forward that we all... Um, and quite rightly, I think, test and look for the weaknesses. But I think we're in such a fast-moving time at the moment, I'd sort of humbly suggest that we really need to look at good, pragmatic, actionable things that we can do uh, rather than seeking a perfect idea, idea that's going to fix all these issues. The path forward is not 
um, you know, let's do the levy and everything will work or let's um, uh, put this much money into public media or um, uh, let's create some tax incentives around local ownership of media. It will be literally dozens of things and we're going to have to be brave enough to try some things and see whether they work as well. So that's the kind of note I wanted to finish this part is just sort of to maybe encourage everyone to think about um, having a crack at a few innovative approaches and having a broad range of measures uh, because one thing, the, the challenge is so significant, one thing won't be sufficient to fix it. But I look forward to answering any questions that you may have and thank you very much for your time today. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. That's fantastic. All right. Great. Well, thanks, everyone. That's been some uh, really interesting um, speeches so far. And now it's time to turn it over to our audience, which is apparently up over 100 now, which is fantastic. So it's great to have so many people here. Obviously, we all care so much about what we, what we um, about our media environment. Um, David Jacobs, you're going to be um, going through and ch choosing the questions. Have you got something for us, please? Yeah. Um, yes, we do have some questions, um, and I'm going to go from the top and work down. Um, we don't have loads, and just to reiterate, anyone who wants to make a question or a comment, I guess, that you want a response, put it in the chat. Um, and so start with one um, from a, another trustee of, of Connected Media, Steve Little. Um, in a recent listener article, Former Judge David Harvey also finds New Zealand's Fair Bar Bargaining Act both flawed and unnecessary. Its solution, stop operators freeloading. freeloading on content developed by others, content which, which is clearly intellectual property. Sorry, I'm getting lost. Instead, amend cop existing copyright law, implementing it through a collective licensing program with licensing societies as agents. Do we need any government initiative to make this happen? And I think that's for everyone. Okay, um, let's pass that over to Irene first. You probably had the longest break for, of all the speakers, so Irene. So um, I don't know if I'm the best person to answer this one. Peter might be better on this one, but I think what he is proposing sounds a little overly complicated. And I'm very much in what Paul just said, pragmatic solutions that we can do reasonably efficiently and reasonably fast. And I think a more straightforward approach to uh, levying the multinationals and feeding it back in in the best way we can think of. You know, Peter had some good ideas there, and I, and I, I and just to answer your question, Peter, about you don't know the government's level of interest. This government is definitely planning to try to do something, um, and so yeah, we need to work out what the best something is. And I'm not sure that it is what this listener article is talking about, which sounds slightly overly complex to me. Right. Thank you, Peter. Oh, Kira again. Um, just a quick note, if if anyone's online and they, they're not familiar with Zoom, if you hover your mouse around the bottom, there's a little box with a, a speech bubble that for chat, and if you click on that, you'll see the, the links. Just just making sure that people are aware of that. Good point. Uh, Thank you, Peter. Uh, 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 of course, I don't, I don't need any, any invitation. I'll, I'll, I won't <laughs> shut up at any point. But uh, in response to that particular question, the 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 issue is 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 a what I'd call a normative one. It's about the the values and the principles upon which you you might base some kind of revenue you know return system, um, and if you base it on copyright, I think you run into a really complicated issue, um, and and that is that the the big plat. I mean, we're talking about the big platforms. We're really talking about Google and and, and Meta, Facebook. Um, I mean, there are some others that play in the same ar arena, but those are the big ones. Do they actually infringe copyright when third parties share the content or share the links to the content? That is a really, really complex issue because they, they don't just they don't just you know copy and republish someone else's content. I mean, clearly that would be con you know that would be copyright violation. That would be IP issue. They don't. They allow other people 
to to host or share or or share links to that content and so it's content discovery that that, that that's really their game and the reason that they've captured all the advertising isn't because they've they've copied everybody else's news content or any other kind of content because it's not just news that gets shared it's all sorts of content they haven't captured that and, and put it on their own websites and then charge people to access it. So it's not it's not like they've gone and you know copied and pirated a whole load of movies that you can now get on Facebook or Google without paying you know the the, the legitimate owners. That's not what's happened. So I think copyright is a huge red herring. I think it's the wrong argument. I think there's a much better argument, and that would be first of all that they have captured and harvested our data en masse. It, it's the capture of our data, and that's not just how old we are, whether we're, you know, which gender we identify with or which region we live in, not just the basic demographics, it's the psychographics. And this is scary, because this is, go, this is the, you couple that with AI, and they're drilling into your patterns of online behavior, they're tracking what you look at online, they're tracking what you buy, that's how they target advertising and the advertisers love it why wouldn't they because rather than a scattergun approach that says well I, you know i'm trying to sell I don't know electronic devices or i'm trying to sell baked beans and rather than think well i'll just send it to millions of people and hopefully two or three percent of them will pick up my message and take notice you can actually find out exactly who buys that kind of product you know who and, and how old they are and which demographic they're in and not just which you know which city but which which region or district that's why the big platforms have captured their content you know have captured the advertising so so it's not a copyright issue i think a much better principle would be to recognize that a those platforms have have taken our time and our attention and our data and exploited it and secondly, that the very nature of their business models has, has, has provided a, a, a massive opportunity to all kinds of what I would call demerit goods, things that don't benefit society, things that harm society. And that could be the mass proliferation of disinformation, a huge threat actually to the media. And I would actually say a key reason why trust in media is going down there are active disinformation campaigns, both in Aotearoa, New Zealand and overseas, trying to make people not trust the media. Now, I'm a media lecturer. I'm the first person to say, don't trust the media. But I'm, I'm the last person to say, throw it all in the bin and don't bother. That is nuts. Mm. I mean, we're, we're about better public media. You can improve the media and get them to do a better job. So for me, the, the right rationale for looking at the platforms and getting them to pay is, first of all, that they they, they steal our data uh, and, and what they feed us in return is not good quality information. They've sucked the lifeblood out of the traditional media and they need to compensate society as a whole for the fact that they have created so much harm. And that includes disinformation. It also includes live stream terrorist videos come to that. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Um, Paul and or uh, Brent, did either of you want to jump in here with an answer to that question? I'll defer to the lawyer, Brent. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Uh, look, TVNZ made a submission on the on the bill. Um, we said at the time we 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 welcome the attempt to to because um, this was the first step really in in a direction to try and and um, you know arrest the issue that we that we have before us. Uh, our, our submission was that um, uh, it was probably more complicated than it needed to be. Um, and, and as Peter points out, AI and the effect of AI, uh, the exam example we gave at the time was um, around daylight saving. And if you're wondering why we have daylight saving and you enter that in Google search, rather than sending the, the answer that came back was a TVNZ answer. I think it's now, I think they've updated it with an RNZ answer now, Paul, but um, there was a TVNZ answer there, but it gave you the answer. And then, and then stated where the source was. So, while originally that that might have been a link back to TVNZ, where we would then obviously um, have advertising around it, um, 
now it's all self-contained within within Google, and and they're using AI to 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 find that information. So that that was what we saw. As for the copyright issue, yeah, look, um, we been in Peter's camp. Far better for me to argue with former judge uh, uh, David Harvey, who knows copyright backwards. But but it's um, I always thought that um, that what he was suggesting there still need to be some change, some legislative change to um. Uh, for, for us to, to work in, in, in that way. Um, but, um, yeah, look, really pleased that there was a, an attempt made to, to legislate in this area, and really pleased, too, that um, Melissa Lee and her time as Minister um, uh, allowed the process to uh, to continue and look forward to seeing what the committee comes back with pretty soon, hopefully. Lovely. Thank you. Paul? Uh, look, I'll just speak briefly to this. In terms of the copyright issue, um, look at that may be, you know, one an example of one of the many things that might be worth looking at. I'm just not sure, um, as um, Brent and Peter have said, whether um, it's it's perhaps more of a cul-de-sac than a real opportunity. But even if it was something which we could look at, it is just so narrow because it's focused on the global platforms who um, allegedly, um, or perhaps really, uh, are breaching our copyright. And it really comes down to Meta and Google. And, you know, Google already has commercial deals with every major outlet in New Zealand. So they've already done their bargaining. And it could be, they could be better deals. And a bargaining regime may help us get better deals. But Meta is just going to quit news in New Zealand if they're brought into that regime. And I think linking it to um, licensing of reuse of content is just too narrow for us. Because this is a wider uh, problem for society. And that's why I think a levy approach, um, which isn't about a breach of, co of copyright, is about social license effectively and um, people who are players in our economy and players in our media system actually having some skin in the game. That feels to me a far better approach. So a broad, comprehensive approach around a new levy, I think, feels far more fertile. And I think Peter made the point at Select Committee which is that if the digital bargaining bill is enacted, it will potentially block a better approach and exploration of things like a levy. So I'm sure the new minister is wrestling with those things at the moment. Mm. Lovely. Thank you very much. Oh, Irene. I just wanted to finish, come off the back of what Paul was saying there. Obviously, for my part of the industry, the local production part, as opposed to the journalism part, um, you know, the levy is far more sensible because we're basically trying to level a playing field because they've come in unregulated, no tax, use broadband, pillage, contribute nothing to the local ecosystem and wreck local content. And they're not just doing it in New Zealand, they're doing it all around the world and everyone is grappling with this. So, yeah, that's that's why for us it might make more sense to part the other bill and actually do an all-encompassing one that helps all of us. Okay, thank you very much. David, what's our next question, please? Um, well, there's a question here from Chris Hebert and, and it relates to the, you know, the TVNZ, and or RNZ public media ethos and, and whether a choice needs to be made there. Peter's pointed out that um, TVNZ's charter requirements were repealed in 2011, so it hasn't had really the public service requirements um, that it had. Chris Hibbert says, my question is more fundamental about the current arrangements for news and current affairs. TVNZ is a commercial operation with a public service mandate which it says it cannot afford. And RNZ is a non-commercial public service entity funded wholly by NZ On Air, but with funding constraints. Is TVNZ conflicted? RNZ has shown it can use new technology for video reporting as seen on its Freeview channel. My question is, why not remove TVNZ's obligations to be a public service broadcaster and increase RNZ's funding so that it can expand its operations in audio and video to developing platforms. Interesting question. I think that's particularly perhaps for, 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 for Paul and for Brent. Okay. Uh, Brent, shall we start with you? 
<laughs> yeah, um, I mean, these are decisions that that uh, are made by our shareholders, uh, not by not by um, not by our our CEO and board or, or Paul and his board, obviously. But um, we uh, and this goes back to the balance I talked about at the start. You know, while while we are a commercial entity, we realise, and there are there is wording in our in our act that talks about us making programs that. Um, uh, are enjoyed by audiences that are available nationwide. That uh, and 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 we have a, a statutory requirement to reflect Māori perspectives as well. So we still have a wee bit there. Um, I actually joined TVNZ after um, or around the time the charter had pretty much disappeared anyway. With the national government coming in, it just uh, it took a, a while for the legislation to catch up. Um, and people did talk about uh, about um, the conflict between the two. And it came up quite a bit um, during the uh, during the stronger public media discussions as well. And and um, look, I think there is a there is a way to balance it. It's it's it, and and look, we would have had to have done it uh, under as a as a merged entity. Um, but but um, Chris, your um, Chris's uh, sorry, uh, Peter's um, uh, correction is is true. Those charter requirements have gone. Just um, but it's something we choose to do, and 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 but those choices become harder uh, when we face those economic headwinds we're facing at the moment. Sorry, is it what's something you choose to do? Oh, we we choose to have more local content. Um, as I said at the start, we 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 could, if we were just following um, the commercial path, then the offering we sh we show at the moment would be quite different. So the, the, there would be less. Local content, but but we know it's important. It's our, it, it, it's about the long term health of the organisation rather than um, just the economic health of the organisation. That's interesting. Okay, thank you, Paul. Uh, thank you, Miles. Thank you for a really good question, Chris. Look, from the RNZ's point of view, um, we have our charter, and it encourages us to innovate and be on whatever platforms. Our audiences may want us may want to uh, connect with us on. So, um, anyone who's familiar with what we do, we still run radio stations. We do podcasting. Tomorrow, uh, a team from RNZ is going to Tauranga for the launch of our latest New Zealand Wars documentary. Um, every day, we're doing multimedia, digital media, um, visual storytelling. So, um, it, it it is relatively straightforward for RNZ compared with the type of um, complexities Brent just referred to around their mandate. We um, also did receive some extra funding next year and we're deploying that to be a stronger multimedia player. One thing I would say, if you look at um, the recent program changes at TVNZ and the big decision of News Hub to end its news division, RNZ won't be um, leaning into any opportunity around broadcast television because that's really, really hard even for the incumbents. But um, digital platforms um, and just having a really great website and all of our radical sharing partnerships means we can do this type of um, compelling public service storytelling more than we've ever been able to. And one thing which I should have mentioned before in terms of our deployment of our new resources, we are commissioning more content from the independent sector, and that will continue to grow. So RNZ will be doing lots in this area, and I think it's a very good thing that we we can and we should be doing it. Right, thank you. Irene, Irene Peter, did you want to say anything more to that, or should we go to the next question? I might just quickly come in and say that um, I think from a, a local production perspective, and actually I would suspect a local broadcast journalism perspective, I don't think we would want to hurt TVNZ to help RNZ I think we'd want them both to be strong. Um, yes, TVNZ doesn't technically have a public media mm -hmm. mandate, but it does do an enormous amount of local content, local journalism, and almost has an unofficial public media mandate just because it's TVNZ and it has the legacy and history and part of New Zealand society that it is. So, yeah, no, don't hurt one to help the other. Make them both as strong as we possibly can. If I, think I could just pick up, if I could just pick up on that if, if, if that's okay Miles so yes. uh, we have our new um, current affairs interview show called 30 with Guy and Espiner um, TVNZ uh, has um, been a terrific partner for us and that is appearing on the TVNZ Plus platform as well as 
every other platform we can get it on. And so there are ways that TVNZ and R&D can work together to address some of these opportunities. Right. I think it's, it is really interesting that um, to, to hear that TVNZ could be more commercial than it actually is, because I guess as audience members, we we, we see it as, as, as it is, and we, we don't realise actually it could be worse. <laughs> so that's quite interesting. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, should we go to the next question, David? Yeah. So I just uh, find that here. Um, Sophie. Sophie Jones. Uh, yeah, um, and thanks for thanking us for our work. From a consumer perspective, what Peter said about social media is entirely accurate. Algorithmic targeting of attention is much more tasty bait for the fish, much more satisfies it, satisfying for the consumer as well as advertisers. Can you speak about how RNZ and TVNZ might be able to use social media to market the idea of, in quotes, reliable, trustworthy information? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, who wants that? Paul? Oh, I can talk really um, quickly to that. Um, we are investing more in our social media team at RNZ. And we're very clear that that's not to promote our services through social media. It's to deliver our an audience experience to those people who are on uh, on social media platforms. So it is a legitimate, legitimate and important platform for us. And we bring all of our charter attributes to that work um, and getting people to connect with our high quality content on social media is a win for us and a win for those um, audience members. Um, one, one thing I would mention is that RNZ um, is also interested in joining an international um, initiative called the Public Spaces Incubator, which is led by the CBC uh, in Canada, but includes um, several of the big broadcasters in Europe where um, they are investing in new tools that would allow uh, safe, non-toxic, constructive, informed conversations to occur on, on platforms as opposed to what sometimes happens on social platforms at the moment. So that's really worth having a look at if anyone's interested in that. Uh, let, drop me an email and I can send you the link to it. So we're interested in um, uh, considering being part of that. And I think, it's again, it's a good example of taking a pragmatic approach and looking to try things. Thank you. That's great. Brent? Yeah, look, trust is, is um, well, it's something Paul and I have talked about you know, quite a bit, in fact, and, 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 and looked at working together on, on how it can be reliably measured and, and then how we can shift the needle. This, this is not a problem that only New Zealand media is facing, but you know, we know ourselves, the recent AUT survey, we, we, we dropped in that around trust. Uh, some of it we come to expect we, you know, during COVID times, we we gave up a lot of our, uh, we, you know, we, we ran the one o'clock bulletins. We we helped spread the message about, about you know, uh, safe behaviour and um, in, in public and, um, you know, the importance of, you know, lockdown rules at the time and that sort of thing. And look, there is going to be a, um, uh, a section of the public who are going to react to that and and not in a not in a particularly good way. And social media has allowed people a platform as well. So it has really democratized media in a lot of ways. But um, with the good also uh, comes the um, comes those views. And and unfortunately, there's that 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 part of society that are going to latch on to those. So um, we. We know that we have we've enjoyed our position as being one of the more you know the, one, one of the most trusted um, media brands in the country, and and it's taken a hit as we all have in recent times. And um, whether we can use social media to market the idea of reliable, trustworthy information, social media is going to be just one way in which we reach our audience. So yes, it will be it will undoubtedly be part of it in the future. Lovely. Thank you. I agree. Can I come in there, Miles? Uh, just yes. off the back of um, both Paul and Brent, I mean, trust obviously is 
incredibly complex at the moment because there's an element of it that's just come out of um, the pandemic, Trumpism, mis and disinformation. It's, it's really complex. And there's an element, I think, I'd be, I'd be really interested to see the research project that um, RNZ have put out into the market because I think as well as what historically was trust, you know, do you trust that this journalism is correct and accurate? I think there's a kind of a thing about not liking journalists because news is negative, because they see the media scrum, et cetera, et cetera. And actually just speaking of social media, there's a, it's just a very small initiative, but there's a little initiative that RNZ is doing at the moment where they do on Instagram a good news report. And I actually think weirdly little things like that are quite helpful because it lifts people that they, it's not all bad news. But I also just wanted to go back to something that Peter said much earlier on when we were talking about whether we can convince government to invest a little more across our funding agencies um, and, you know, also, you know, how the new money might be administered if we get money on a levy. Um, one thing I think I don't think if it was up to me, I would do another special fund like the Public Interest Journalism Fund again. I think it's better to just subtly put the music, to put the money into the funders and some of it's on journalism, some of it's on this, some of it's on that. I think if you do a special thing like that, you slightly give people a club to beat us with. And I think that is what happened sadly last time. Yeah, absolutely. They had the New Zealand Army had been funding journalism prior to the PIJF, and nobody said a word. Mm. And then, mm. it's true. Peter, did you have anything more you wanted to add to that? Oh no, no. I, I think Irene's got a really good point. I I just say that the Public Interest Journalism Fund was was quite significantly, you know, misrepresented, and you know we we've had some feedback even from our own members that are quite sceptical about about that kind of arrangement. And I, I understand why, um, but it doesn't need to be that way. Um, you, you know, if it, if it just became a generic part of another funding agency like New Zealand Air, I mean, I, I, th I think that might work fine. What nobody's really looked at, though, is all the fantastic material that was produced under that. There hasn't been a single complaint under the Public Interest Journalism Fund that was upheld. Yeah, the, the, all the fuss is really focused on the on the idea that it, that ostensibly it was meant to have some you know, obligation towards you know, adhering to Te uh, Te or Waitangi principles, and and that was there in the language, but it but it it nobody got declined because they weren't pushing you know an ideological view of the government. It just wasn't there. Um, and there was some absolutely fantastic material that was produced under under the PIGF, I, I, including things like local democracy reporting, which is still continuing with RNZ. You know, it, it, it's just so important that we don't lose that stuff. Um, and I, I, I got very upset by the fact that in cabinet papers, it, it, it showed that the decision to move towards, and I see Willie Jackson is here, he may have something to say about this, that, that the decision to develop the um, Fair Digital News Bargaining Bill was informed by a perception that the public didn't trust publicly funded journalism anymore. Um, and, I, and I thought at that moment that the disinformation campaigners had won, that, that, that disinformation was shaping the scope of public policy. And I was very concerned about that. And it's not to blame Willie for that, but that was in the Cabinet paper that went forward. Yeah, thank you. Now, Trisha Dunleavy, who is actually your colleague, Peter, has raised her hand, and I'm making a uh, an executive captain's call, if you like, to let her actually speak. Um, Trisha is a, another lecturer, a professor, I believe, at, uh, at Victoria Te Aranguaka. Um Trisha, what was it you wanted to ask? I just wanted to um, kia ora everybody, and, and thanks very much to our speakers for their amazing um, insights really about this really dreadful situation that we're in. I just wanted to support what Peter was saying, and I think the, the speaker before, the person before, um, that idea of transparency seems to me uh, to, to, to lean us in the direction of continuing with contestable funding, for particularly for local content that is of, for example, um, you know, that is outside of, you know, the basic uh, kind of programming in-house that TVNZ is producing, you know, the kind of 
the kind of discretionary stuff, the contestable funding, has actually protected our public media funds from criticism for decades now. You know, if you compare that, and I've, I've written a lot about the past, but I've also written a lot about the current era of multi-platform television. Um, and I, I can see that relative to old systems we've used, this is the best way. So when someone said, uh, don't call it the Public Interest uh, Journalism Fund, um, I think it was Irene, actually, and put it into a fund, the strength of our funds is is the crucial thing and the the um transparency of the way in which those funds are administered to producers or to directly to institutions depending on the situation um is that is the strength that, that protects them from criticism we need more money you know i'm just picking up on a couple of things i've heard we we, we need that money um for mainstream television i i feel like there's a there's a precedent in the funding of of uh Fakata maori that could be applied to TVNZ. I mean, obviously, the big question, as Peter's raised, is how do you pay for it? But I'm going, uh, Māori Television gets um, a kind of fund, and, and it's a non-commercial provider, so it's a, it's not a fair comparison, but I'm just saying that TVNZ's future is not is less commercial than it ever can be or has been in the past. Uh, two things. One, the advertising revenue will not recover, and secondly, we we, we will be moving to non-linear, right? We, you know, we also have a future where where linear television itself is at risk. So, so we're talking about the future of television New Zealand as one that's as a, a BVOD, not a uh, necessarily a linear a provider. And and the only thing a BVOD can offer, if you think of the the the, the international examples we could look at, is distinctive programming. And that equals local content. So I'm sorry, uh, there's no getting away from that. Uh, there's not going to be a choice for TVNZ to sort of behave more commercially and do less local content. In a sense, that's not a choice it has. So um, our choice really is to argue for more money, um, which will dispose the government to sort of explore uh, how it could regulate to raise money. We really have to put money at the top of the list that we have to accept that TVNZ is in a changed environment to even to the one it was in in 2021 when I was a member of the um, public media group and we were looking at the the, the, um, uh, the business case. We, we were looking at that. Even, even then, uh, what has come to pass, what was expected at that moment has actually happened earlier than we even expected. Yeah. Okay, so fine and advertising revenue in the last year has been more than than we even expected. And and the argument, the, the core argument in that um, business case for us was TVNZ needed uh, increased public funding going forward to operate as a public television network. You know, um, the the conflict for me in that in that situation is that if if any of that money comes out of the local content funding uh, pool, the New Zealand on air funding that causes another problem, a very significant problem, because the contestable funding has been very, very important for that thing of transparency and defending it against criticism. Excellent. That's a big rant. Sorry about that. Thank you. Thank you, Tricia. That's great. Now, we've got a special guest in the audience, or not, not really a special guest, but a surprise guest, I suppose, um, and that's the previous Minister of Media, well, the previous, previous Minister of Media <laughs> and Communications, <laughs> Willie Jackson, uh, and... I think it's only right to um, ask Willie what your views are on uh, where things are at at the moment since you left. Oh, kia ora, kia ora, Miles, kia ora, kia ora um, look, look, I'm sorry I came on late. I would have I'm really enjoyed the quarter of the last just the last 10, 15 minutes when I've been up and down the country. Um, and uh, well, I, I think things are a mess actually, <laughs> and I think that's been uh, <laughs> pretty well summed up in the last 10, 15 minutes that I've uh, uh, listened to. Um, I'm not sure if people know, but I, I, what we're doing and is uh, um, we, we, we're, we're attempting to call a media summit at Parliament, on uh, um, which I think to bring all the different parties together. I wrote, I sent a a, um, a letter to Melissa uh, probably the week before she she was uh, um, taken out of the job. So we're going to. Uh, pass that on to Goldie. Uh, I think it was passed on to him yesterday. Um, and uh, we're just, uh, we're, we're tying up invitations. We think that it would be very um, appropriate to have it out of Parliament and 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 to make it a bipartisan type of, of meeting because it's no good going in with, uh, you should have done, you know, like it's just nonsensical really if we, if we go down that path of, uh, having a, a scrap, we've already done that. That's why you people may have seen I was quite. Uh, I didn't. Uh, I, the media wanted me to dance on 
Melissa's grave and all that. It's not my style. I think we've just got to be constructive and, and get on with it because we've got so much in front of us at the moment. And so I just thought, um, Miles, uh, you know, rather than uh, people, people will, will would have heard what I've had to say in terms of this government, uh, but that's not going to be any use if we if we to have a total breakdown in terms of the relationship. So um, I, I get on pretty well with Paul, Paul Goldsmith, believe it or not, and uh, um, I felt that if we could. Um, come together with this type of court at all and 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 and, and actually in parliament um and and set a day aside and at the moment we've got we've got friday week the 10th uh, set aside for it we we're getting we've been working on it for the last couple of days and maybe getting get get a, a get a, and i think paul might might be um open to addressing us you know so i'm happy if we to facilitate it to host it and then yeah. to bring in bring in the 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 ideas because uh, you know I I know that there's but you know how hard we push say for the digital bargaining bill you know I think that we've um, I think we've got them close to that um, I, I know I was listening to the uh, uh, the talk about the public journalism fund I I was a guest speaker at the Tarito graduation about uh, three days ago and I've seen firsthand how um, that that fund has helped particularly in terms of our communities. Maybe we didn't sell it well enough, but the right wing certainly went after us big time, went after us big time. Uh, and the line that, you know, the, as I keep saying, they, they, they keep saying, oh, the government should, shouldn't be giving media money. I says, if all my life, or through my whole life, the government has given media money. So I, I'm not I'm not sure what planet they're, they're, they're coming from. You know, I said, and I keep, went on Duncan Garner's show, Law, I was with Laws the other day, and I said, I'm not sure what we're coming from because the government has always given media money. You know, that that, that, that is just the reality. But the way they, they picked off the... <clears throat> the public uh, interest journalism fund, I think, was I think it was disgraceful actually. And I, I I was talking with Mark Jennings about it, um, you know, with the with the treaty um requirements. That that those treaty requirements were certainly not put on by by us. Uh, but the other side of that is sounds like everyone traversed it pretty well anyway. You know, it was just do you uh, do you will you support a partnership? And everybody said yes. I don't, I, don't, I can't think of anyone who got who who were not funded because. Uh, they didn't sort of uh, support the uh, the treaty or anything, and you know, and and so you got you had people like Winston and them jumping on this, you know. In terms of of where we are, I I was, you know, I have to say I was very disappointed with um, the initial. Well, I'm very disappointed with government because there was no media is not a priority with this government. You know, you see that in the plans, and all I'm saying is, you know, if it's not. Uh, um, but when I when I look at when I looked at the news hub deal, I, I did feel that that government could have actually done a lot more in terms of cobbling things together, in terms of talking to New Zealand on air, in terms of talking to big business, uh, you know. And I feel, with respect to Sinead, that if the stuff deal is the resolution at, at the end, um, and if the prime minister thinks that's the greatest deal on earth, I think we're all in trouble, you know, uh, because I think we can I think we can do better than that. Um, but we have to work together, uh, and I and I have no problem working with the government in a bipartisan way going forward. So I just wanted to put that on the table, Miles. That yep. that I think something a bit bigger than what to, what we're doing today uh, on the table in a couple of weeks, and we see it as a media summit with with key industry people coming mm. in with key recommendations coming out working maybe in tandem with the government might be helpful for the current situation. Yeah, I think so, because it's only people realise how important media is when, when they realise that they're up to lose something. It's the same with TVNZ7. Suddenly mm. we realise that actually people really do care about media, otherwise they'll be they'll just sort of just relax and sit back. Irene, what was it you wanted to say? I just wanted to come off the back of what Willie was saying there and a little bit of Patricia as well. Um, when the previous government was in and national and now part of this coalition government were campaigning against ANZPM, the, the public media project, I remember distinctly that Christopher Luxon, now PM, saying public media is really important in New Zealand, but this is not the way to do it. It's too complicated. Now, you could have had... There was a, 
fair argument that maybe ANZPM was a little bit complicated. But it was interesting that he said that because, you know, obviously this is, you know, there are better ways to do it. Well, obviously a better way to do it is not to take 7.5% out of all of our current funding. Yeah, agencies. Yeah. And just to pick up on what Trisha was saying, that NZ on air model and, and Tamangai Pile is the same. That That is internationally unique, that contestable funding model, model. And it does work incredibly well. And again, picking up on what, um, Willie said, you know, RNZ has always been funded by government. NZ on Air and the other funding agencies have always been funded by government. It, if things are done properly, mm -hmm. it's fine and people don't question it. It's just that when we did the PIJF, it, well, to be fair, it happened at a really bad time, but there were a few factors that came in. And so, yeah, I would always suggest that we just keep the NZ on Air base money high enough to do all the things we need to do out of it. So, Totoku, Trish, Trisha, I think, mm -hmm. and, and, and Willie, I, yeah, I, that's, sure, yeah, it's actually very important. And if we could get a bit of a cross-party thing on that yeah. and what the public media spend in New Zealand actually needs to be and that we're not a, a football and everybody's picking and poking, that would be a wondrous thing. I think that, right. that, that, that might be the way to go, Irene. I, I just I see Brent on there, so we'll be getting invites to TVNZ, RNZ. We've already got Julian Wilcox, and I spoke to Jack Tame, Brent, so could you give him the green light? Because I reckon <laughs> uh, Julian, so I've already got Julian. Jack wants to do it too, so he'll see you up tomorrow. So if we have those two out the front as sort of emceeing the conference, I think you've got two very high-profile people from both sides. So I'll, I'll give Jack a call Sounds now, good. Brent. So you gave him the green light, eh? Sounds good. Peter, what was it you were going to say? Peter Johnson? Oh, Kira, th thanks very much to, to Willie for his contribution. I, I think that's really, really interesting, and I certainly welcome a bipartisan approach. I think that's way overdue, and, and really, that's that's great to hear that you're looking at that. Um, you know, I, I don't know Paul's, Paul Goldsmith as well as you do, but but I, I'm hoping he'll be able to have a good core arrow and uh, get, get some solutions on the table. I've got to say, though, that that fair digital news bargaining bill is not the best approach. Everything that's been written about that in the Australian context, uh, you know, that, that's credible and independent and not doesn't have a vested interest in in getting some money out of it, says that it's really a, 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 a lame duck. Uh, and I won't go on in detail because I've written about this, but it, it doesn't guarantee that the money that goes to the news media will be reinvested mm. in news media or public interest news media. We have, we have. And, and there is nothing to stop. And, and the, all the indications of this is going to happen. One of the big actors walking away from the table and saying, right, we're just not going to carry news on our platform. Meta, yeah, Facebook has already done that in Canada. They did it temporarily in Australia. And they've said that they're going to walk away from any future deals in, in Australia as well. Yeah. We're running out of time, Peter. Sorry to interrupt you. But we yeah, so, uh, uh, so, so the fair digital bargaining bill, but we just need to go to one more question from our audience on a different subject. So David, I understand you've got a, a couple more questions there. Um, let's just see if we've got time for at least one, maybe two. David. Yeah, I'm just briefly going to comment on the back of what oh. Peter was saying. Oh, okay. that, um, a levy does guarantee that the, um, that the money goes to journalism, and that's why it's a better solution um, okay. to, the, to the bill. Thank uh, you. Back to the questions, um, David. Coming up. So this one inevitably, Brent, I'm sure you knew that um, you were going to get a question about um, and about about um, ago. And it's, I mean, really, I mean, two. One is why, when it w was individually making money, uh, has it has it been chopped? And two, maybe a creative solution is why can't it be chopped up chopped up into smaller bits and um, put on seven sharp, maybe twice a week. That's the gist of two comments. Yeah, look, that's a that's a great suggestion, David, from the um, who put that forward. And look, I think that's the sort of thing we'll see, you know, because we do have a commitment to um, to a consumer affairs um, content, and you'll see it you'll you'll see it coming up in, in other places. Um, the decision to make it when it was still making money, um, it's an incredibly hard decision. And um, but but you know, like a lot of businesses, we we do sometimes have to, uh, even 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 lines that are profitable, um, it's about a couple of things. First of all, what does it cost us to make that profit? Now, profit is profit, but 
but there might be um, uh, a better candidate for that investment that, that will see a better return for us. So we have to bear that in mind. And secondly, we have, as Tricia said, we've got a digital future. So TVNZ Plus will be the way that we, we uh, that audiences uh, enjoy our content. And I hope a lot of other content that isn't made or bought or commissioned by us. You know, we, I, I really hope that TVNZ Plus in the future is, is the home for New Zealand content. And, and we're starting to see that. Paul mentioned uh, Guyan's new show, which will uh, have a place on the platform. And we've spoken to other, other broadcasters about them getting their, their, their uh, content on a platform where it has a really good chance of, uh, of being seen. So, yeah, there, there's, there's a lot that goes into these decisions. Um, and can I just say personally, the, the, the decision to cut Sunday and, and Fair Go were uh, two of the most confronting decisions that I've had to make as a member of the TVNZ exec and, and, uh, and, and, and two of my favourite shows. But we will need to find a way to repurpose that type of content uh, for digital audiences in the future. Okay, thank you. David, what's our last question of the day? Last questions on AI from Gavin. Kia ora, Gavin Ellis. Um, and the question is, thoughts on the impact of AI? It has the potential to plunder news media on a scale that will make search engines small beer. Thank um, Okay, Peter, would you like to start us off with that? Uh, AI. Oh, oh, gosh. It's a small uh, question. Small it's subject. a small question. Um, I'll try and be brief, which I'm, I'm very bad at, as you might have gathered. Um, I think my first point is that AI is not a single technology. I think I think it's it's hugely misunderstood. It, it's a vast range of potential applications about machine learning and the way the way that the that, that, that cognitive systems can be built into software whereby they they learn and by by the data that they've already picked up and reinterpret and analyze that. So, you know, I, I think I think there's going to be huge potential for AI in marketing, but I think what's going to happen is that that will actually intensify um, the, uh, you know, the, the, the pressure pressure on, on conventional business models in the media sector uh, to try and maximize, you know, eyeballs and attention, because what it will do algorithmically is, be, is, is become even more efficient in feeding back to us the kinds of choices that we've previously made. Um, oh, Gavin said in the talk, he's talking about Lafarge language models in particular. Um, let's just say uh, there's a couple of students that wish they hadn't used chat GPT in their essays for me this trimester. <laughs> Good to know. Thanks, Peter. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, thank you. Now, Brent, you did talk about AI briefly. Was there any more you wanted to uh, add? to um to the question no that exhausted my that that 30 seconds i gave before exhausted my expertise <laughs> on ai but but look and one of the things we talked a bit about legislation and, and 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 the need to change legislation legislation or the best legislation is future proofed and and it's really hard it's really hard to um to to design legislation that's going to um address ai and whatever comes after ai as well so yeah um it's really hard, but we're already seeing it. We're already seeing it. That example I gave you about that daylight saving query in Google um, is an example of of um, how that information is 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 taken from either uh, well TVNZ or RNZ and and repackaged and without the need for us to to go to either of those sites. So we're already seeing it. Lovely. Thank you, Paul. I just really quickly, um, great question, Gavin. I think that the issue is we really don't know. Um, what this is going to mean, uh, and it, not just in terms of um, search for news or, or news distribution, but even content creation itself, um, how this may or may not um, turbocharge some of the problems we have around misinformation, some of the problems around the economic models that we're wrestling with today. Um, I think my um, uh, sort of view at this moment is that it is the biggest um, change since social media was uh, unleashed on us, it wasn't that long ago, about 15 years ago. Um, at that stage, we had no way of seeing um, the, the negative consequences and the way that would change the world. So um, there's no way that we can regulate this, put a genie in the bottle. Um, so it's going to be a profound challenge for us. 
for media companies um, looking at it more optimistically and constructively, it will be um, a very useful tool if deployed correctly. Um, it will um, potentially create some fantastic opportunities around journalism. Um, but like all of these technologies, it's a double-edged sword. So um, it's going to be uh, it's going to be pretty rocky, I think. There'll be some good things, but no doubt there'll be some very uh, tricky things as well. Yeah. All right, thank you, Irene. Was there anything you wanted to add? Oh, very similar. You know, for the production industry, pros and cons. I mean, you know, we'll would like to think there'd be some way of regulating, you know, not taking people's written work, their faces, their voices, and, you know, misappropriating those. Um, but there's also, you know, positive uses. And actually, particularly as money gets tighter and tighter for the, the bottom end of our industry, you know, people in the new and emerging sector, it is a chance to sort of, you know, play with some cheaper technology, make a short film that way, whatever. So yeah, there's there's potentially some good things, but there's potentially some thorns as well. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, look, it's um, it's just gone five thirty, uh, so I think we could keep going for at least another half hour. But I'm not suggesting that. Um, but I do think that maybe there's time for us to to have another one of these meetings. We've had some really really great speakers, and I really appreciate. Uh, you all, all coming along, Irene Gardner, Peter Thompson, Brett McAnulty, and Paul Thompson, really high caliber of speakers. So thank you all very, very much. And uh, and also thank you to the audience, um, the public who came along with some really good questions. Uh, and um, I, um, yeah, I just really appreciate you all coming along and hopefully we might do this again in a few months time and God knows where the industry will be at that point. It could have all completely changed, who knows? Um, yeah, so thank you very much. And um, we've got an, a Better Public Media AGM starting next. It's for members only. We might actually adjourn for uh, five or ten minutes, cup of tea break, and come back at 20 to 6 for that. But in the meantime, thanks, everybody. Really appreciate you joining us today. Thanks, Miles, very much, everyone. Yeah, thanks, everyone. This is where everyone should be clapping and la, 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 la. But, you know, it's I'm sure we're all... Imagining it, right? It's all it's all happening. <laughs>